I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus 16 should be familiar to those who have associated themselves with a study of the Bible that began on the Day of Atonement. <laughs> Leviticus 16 is a description of that day. In my Bible, it's got a little heading at the beginning of the chapter. And it says, the Day of Atonement. We'll look at verses 29 through 31. 29, 30, and 31. And there, in my Bible, it has another little title. Perhaps some of you might have this. It says, Feast of Expiations. Anybody got that? Okay, well, another name for atonement. We'll look at some of these words in uh, our study today. Verse 29. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be done of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. Have you ever afflicted your soul? What does it mean to afflict your soul? How do you afflict yourself? Uh, sometimes we self-inflict. You ever had a self-inflicted wound? I didn't mean to do it. It was an accidental situation. Ray uh, had a self-inflicted... You know, we were trying to put the top on the desk in there. It's a heavy top. And it slides down into place just ever so precisely. You've got to have the base turned just right and, the, and then the top. <clears throat> has these guides inside there that will allow it to fall down. Well, before it falls down, there's a gap around the top, and it's flush with the sides. He afflicted his finger. A uh, self-inflicted wound. But how do we afflict ourselves? Um, this says, it's sort of a command, you shall afflict your souls. You shall afflict it. Uh, traditionally, the Day of Atonement has been also referred to, at least in the New Testament, we think this is referring to the Day of Atonement, in Acts chapter 27. Uh, Paul is making his last journey. He's on his way to Rome. And he's going by boat, by ship. I better not say boat around here. Where'd Kevin go? He was here. He always makes a big deal about the difference between boat and ship. <laughs> um, he's on his way to Rome. And it's late in the season. In that part of the world, the weather changes after a certain time of the year. In the winter, the wind picks up. The sea's a little more rough. And uh, sea travel is not as gentle or pacific. Here we have a we have an ocean on the west coast, the left coast. We call the Pacific Ocean. Why do we call it that? Peaceful. Acts twenty-seven. Okay, now uh, they're going to take off sailing. They've been delayed a little while. It says the winds were contrary. The winds aren't really good for sailing. So finally they're going to leave, and uh, it's gone several days, verse 7, and the wind isn't cooperating, and here Crete is nearby, and uh, they 
stay in a place called Fair Havens. Verse 9. Now, when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous, the winds have not only been contrary, but they're category something. <laughs> you heard about category winds lately? Things like Harvey. We mentioned Irma. Maria. Um, have had categories, haven't they? And he says, why is it now dangerous? Here it is. Because the fast was now already past. Many understand this be a reference to the Day of Atonement. The fast. Well, that's one way that people could afflict themselves. Uh, you could take a day. Is that, that's probably a good thing. Every once in a while, let, let the system coast for a while. And uh, purify your body from a fast. We went camping this week. And um, we thought we had everything packed up. I would put my computer in the back of the car because Carolyn was going to, I understood, transfer all the stuff from the house up to the trailer that we were going to be taking. It's up here. So I made sure it was going to be in where everything was going to get transferred. But she didn't take the car. She took <laughs> the van and, um, I mean, the, uh, the other camper thing because it already had stuff in it. Rather than transfer it out into the car and then the car into there, she just took the van, uh, the camper up there. So the car with my laptop in the back of it <laughs> and my Bible and... All, my songbook and all the things I wanted to work on, my cell phone, all that stuff got left behind. So I fasted. I had a fast. Two days, no computer. That's good for you. You know, you, it, it's, you re become resourceful. I said, do we not have any paper? I want some paper, at least. And I rummaged around in my guitar case. Did take the guitar. Had a bunch of sheets of music in there, and on the back of those sheets, blank. <laughs> I had some paper, and um, I filled it up. Here's the notes for the sermon. See, there's the printing on that side, and there's notes on this side. Uh, so the fast, uh, the Day of Atonement, is fasting from food the most effective fast? There's other, way, there's other fasts. That um, let's um, let's look at this here. Now I'm going to get right into here. We go. Oh, you want that up there for a little while? You can put it on as a title. <laughs> There's the title, Atonement Sabbath, and we'll talk about that in a moment too. But the Day of Atonement is a Sabbath, which we will look at here in a moment. We already read that in the scripture reading, right? It's uh, no work. <laughs> There it is, Atonement Sabbath, the title for today. And to bring this up to date, here we got uh, September 21. Ten days ago, we uh, thought about, recognized, did some consideration of, and, and uh, focused on the new moon. Ten days ago. Ten days between new moon and the Day of Atonement, which... The new moon is on the first day of the month, first day of Tishri. That's the name of the seventh month. Seven moons since the first month when uh, you have enough barley, some places, that in the Old Testament, they would wait until they had enough barley. Okay, okay this will be the beginning of the year. And they'd wave that barley uh, as a promise, first fruits, you heard that term. First fruits, more to come. This is a promise of a greater harvest to come. And so by the time you come to Pentecost, you had enough to bake a couple of loaves of barley bread, and they'd wave the two loaves on Pentecost. Well, that's uh, getting a little ahead. Now, it's the seventh month. You count seven new moons, and you come to the trumpets of the seventh month, beginning of the seventh month. Ten days into that month, Day of Atonement. Probably the, well it is, the most solemn, 
serious day of the year. In many ways, uh, it's a day of judgment. Sins for the whole year are going to be addressed that day. And uh, people look forward to having them blotted out, removed, taken away. Isn't that a good thought? All of the, can you, I think of all the things I've done this past year I'm not real happy about. But to know that those will be, what does uh, Micah say? Micah chapter 7. I like this one. Let's see, where's Micah? Jonah, Micah. Last chapter, almost per near the last verse, next to the last verse, but let's go to verse 18. Micah 7, verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee? That's a good question. As, and God asks that himself in Isaiah 45, 44 and 45. He, several times he says, Who will you compare me to? Isaiah 40 also says it. Who is a God like unto you that pardons iniquity? Ah! That's good news. That's gospel. Isn't that what the word good news, gospel means? Good news. He pardons iniquity. Here's a God that pardons. What about the other gods? The gods that the other people in the world... What did Paul say? There's gods many and lords many. What are they? Do they pardon iniquity? Huh? <laughs> yeah. But you've got to appease them. Okay. He passes by transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retains not his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He's a merciful God. What did, what did he say when Moses was up there on Mount Sinai? Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. The Lord, the Lord. Who's speaking here? Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Abraham, Abraham. Martha, Martha. The Lord, the Lord. A God merciful and gracious and abundant in goodness and truth. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. He will subdue our iniquities. How about that? Not just pardon our iniquities of those that are past but to subdue our iniquities so that we don't have any in the future subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea you know how deep the sea is deeper then Mount Everest is high. <laughs> in the Mariana Trench, Indian Ocean, seven miles down. That's a long ways down. But he removes them even further away than that. Seven miles, not very far. Let's go to I, uh, Psalm 103. Psalm 103. I like this psalm. starts out with a song I like to sing in the shower. When you got good acoustics in the bathroom, echoes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless His holy name. And all that is within me. And all that is within me, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And forget not his benefits, he pardons my iniquity. There it is. He healeth my diseases. You need that too, don't we? And there is so much about our health that depends on our spirit. What's going on in our mind affects much of what goes on in our body. And it was the man let down through the roof who needed first 
the assurance that his sins were forgiven. And then he could be healed. And Jesus says, <laughs> which is greater, to forgive a man his sins or to say unto him, take up your bed and walk? And he did both. But look at verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Not seven miles, although that's pretty unreachable. How do you get down there? <laughs> but as far as the east is from the west, how far is that? Never, never mean. Well, on the global scale, you'd say you'd come around to the same spot again. But in terms of direction, how about on the galactic scale? How far is east from the west? How about on the cosmic scale? <laughs> if you take the prevailing scientific opinion, 13 and a half billion light years, that's a long ways away. I think I suspect it's further than that. <laughs> The Day of Atonement, we uh, read there in Leviticus 16, it's a, it's a Sabbath. The Hebrew for that, the Hebrew expression is Shabbat Shabbaton. The Sabbath, Shabbat, of the Sabbaths, Shabbaton, plural. The Sabbath of the Sabbaths. What are the Sabbaths? Well, during the year, we're, we're looking at a... a an expanded vision here of God's workings for the sake of man's salvation. And it began long before this earth was created. A council of peace was made between the Father and the Son. You read that in Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. 13. Council of peace was between them both. But that was way back then. When Adam and Eve sinned, then was put into play a method of saving man which was going to depend on a great sacrifice. The sacrifice of God's Son. This is a sacrifice that the Father made in giving His Son and it's the sacrifice that the Son made in giving Himself. 1 John 4, verse 9. In this is manifested the love of God for us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we should live through Him. John three sixteen. obviously. God so loved the world. That's the love of the Father in the sacrifice of His Son. Galatians 2, 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the f life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. Jesus gave himself. No greater love has any man than this, than a man gives up his life for his friends. The Shabbat Shabbaton, the Sabbath of the Sabbaths. Well, the Sabbaths begin with Passover. And we're going to uh, we'll expand this and show that. There's seven of them during the year. Sab uh, Passover is not a Sabbath. But the first day of unleavened bread, when Jesus rested in the tomb. First day of unleavened bread. And as you read in uh, Leviticus 23, it is a holy convocation. A day where there's no servile work. That means you don't work for salary, for pay. For profit. Ah, you can do other things. You do what needs to be done, but you don't work for it for remuneration, physical, you know, financial gain. Now, the, uh, seven days later. Why seven days? Because seven days you had no leaven. The feast of unleavened bread. You ever had unleavened bread? Anytime you eat a cracker, that's unleavened bread. <laughs> Wheat thins. Uh, Triscuits. Uh, <laughs> What's leaven? 
Yeast, that's one type of leaven. That's uh, biological leaven. How about chemical leaven? Have a little health talk here. Soda, soda bicarbonate, which is an alkali. And you have that with an acid, like vinegar or lemon juice or some type of acidic thing. And combination, what happens? You ever, you ever did that? Soda, yeah, put some acid in there and, you know, vinegar. Take the soda bicarbonate, throw it in there and up. Well, you do that in cooking and, and the bread rises and whatever. Oh, so that's uh, chemical leavening. And then we learned, just learned recently, there's mechanical leavening. If you can beat that flour half <laughs> hard enough and beat some air into it, uh, then uh, maybe that'll help it rise too. Leaven, though, is a symbol of what happens when sin gets into our lives. What happens? It only takes one bad apple in the barrel, right? Isn't that what we say? One bad apple spoils the whole bunch. So what does le leaven as a symbol of sin permeates and expands and grows? But leaven is also, there's good leaven too. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a, a woman who takes three measures of meal and leaven, puts leaven into three measures of meal, bakes it, and it expands. Kingdom of heaven expands. There's good leaven, there's bad leaven. So we have uh, the first and last days of unleavened bread are holy convocations. There's two. That's the first two. Seven weeks later. So you got seven days. Now you got seven weeks. What happens? Pentecost. And it's a holy convocation. There's three. Trumpets, the new moon. You go through Leviticus 23 and itemize these. That's the next holy convocation. No work. Day of Atonement. Oh, that's the Sabbath of the Sabbath. But that's only five. We got two more. The first and last days of tabernacles. Also seven days. So there's all seven. But... Day of Atonement is the pinnacle. That's the important one uh, when it comes to having your sins removed as far as the east from the west and down the deep of the sea and removed and forgiven and pardoned and blotted out. There's a term that uh, we'll look at too. Seventh month. Now, all through the year, uh, up until Day of Atonement, there's sacrifices. There's blood being shed. Symbol of Christ's blood. He's going to die. And what happened on Passover? Finally, a Passover came after 4,000 years of sacrifices. And the Son of God died, crucified on the day of Passover. He was the Passover lamb. And every one of these uh, sacrifices, and I looked this up, you know, I had always thought that they took, it stuck in my mind, you know, about them sprinkling the blood seven times before the veil. They didn't do that on every sacrifice. There's only some special sacrifices where that happened. Most of the time, they sprinkled it on the brazen altar, the altar of burnt sacrifice. So you go to Leviticus chapter 1 where they have a lamb and a man puts his hands on the head of the lamb, confesses his sin, kills the lamb, they collect the blood, they sprinkle it on the altar where the lamb is going to be burnt, and then they pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. Okay. Chapter 2 is meal, or, or the meat offering, the, which is flour, no blood. So skip that one. Chapter 3 is a, a sacrifice made from uh, the flock or herd. So cha chapter 1 is the bullock or lamb or goat. But the uh, third is just from the flock, a lamb or goat, not a bullock. And it's a peace offering. When do you do a peace offering? But there it's sprinkled on the altar again and poured out the base. So, so far it's just out in the courtyard at the altar. Chapter 4 is the sin of ignorance. Now this one is different. The sin of ignorance. Have you ever done something you didn't know? I didn't know that was wrong. 
Ignorance is no excuse for the law. That's what the highway patrolman will tell you. Um, evidently, there were situations when something happened and you didn't even know you were affecting somebody by what you did. And when it's brought to your attention, you feel so much remorse, you offer a sacrifice. And uh, chapter 4 of Leviticus talks about the sin of ignorance. And there's three categories. One for the priest. If the priest does something, now that's important because that, that can affect the whole nation, the whole congregation. Then you have, the second one is the whole congregation, it says. If the whole congregation is involved in something that they didn't know that they were doing wrong. And it comes to the whole congregation. Then the elders, those representing the congregation, put their hands on the head of the animal, confess the sin of ignorance for the whole congregation. And the last one is the ruler, the king. He represents the entire nation. If the king does something he didn't realize, then he does this uh, same sacrifice. Here is where the blood is taken into the holy place and sprinkled. Well, first of all, it's touched to the horns of the altar of burnt sacrifice, poured out the base. The rest is touched to the horns of the altar of incense and sprinkled seven times before the veil. There's the seven times before the veil. I thought it was all of the sacrifices. It's this one. Now, there is one more that has seven times, but it's to the tabernacle of the congregation, which is the holy place. Another term for the holy place. And that involves the red heifer. That's in Numbers chapter 19. The red heifer sacrifice is a sacrifice for purification. If someone has a... They've touched a dead body. Uh, they've cared for somebody who died in their in their care, in their tent, they died while they were in their care. Same thing as touching a dead body. If uh, they, what's all the list of things involved here? A bunch of different things. Um, different diseases, if they uh, had uh, problems of health that made them uh, contagious, then they could be purified by the sacrifice of the red heifer. Now the red heifer was a special animal, had to be, um, never had a yoke on it. It's a symbol of Jesus though, because it had to have no spot or blemish, just like all the lambs and the goats and the bullocks, they all had to, have, they had to be spotless. The red heifer as well, but it never was used in the farm to pull a plow, or never had a yoke on it. And they took the red heifer and they didn't sacrifice it in the temple area. Didn't do it there by the burnt offering. And didn't burn it on the altar of burnt offering. They took it outside the camp. Where was Jesus crucified? Outside the walls. Outside the city. It is burned. It's sacrificed. And the blood is not collected. Except uh, the blood, blood is collected, but it doesn't go back into the temple. It doesn't go back into the courtyard or anything. The ashes are collected after it's burned, and they are saved for use to prepare the water of purification. Now, we're going to see a little later on how this comes to work. Then they would take some of the blood and sprinkle it toward the temple tabernacle of the congregation, the holy place. So it didn't go inside, but it just sprinkled in that direction from outside the camp, from outside the city, ultimately. Okay, so I, I just want to go through all those things. The Day of Atonement, of course, is once a year. There, the sacrifice of the goat, the Lord's goat, and the bullock for the high priest, the blood is taken into the most holy place. Throughout the year, it's all out in the courtyard and uh, with these other things. But this day, it's taken into the most holy place. And it's sprinkled before the mercy seat. So we have the, the two areas where it's most important. Now, all of these had 
sacrifices. Every one of them had sacrifices involved. In fact, every day of the unleavened bread, every day of tabernacles, they all had sacrifices every, all the days. But the Passover and atonement were special in that it affected, uh, it was used for the entire, all the people. Not individual sacrifices for the blood for that person, but for everybody. And there's the fast. We talked about the fast. What is the fast? We, talk, we said um, fasting from food. What's the fast that God really wants? Isaiah 58 is really talking about the Day of Atonement. Have you ever noticed the Day of Atonement language when we read this chapter? I've summarized it very briefly there, but if you look at chapter uh, 58, verse 1, cry aloud, spare not. Now what happens 10 days before the Day of Atonement? It is such an important day. Announcement is made to everybody in the whole country that the day is coming. 10 days. And the Day of Atonement is going to be here. So on trumpets, they start blowing the trumpet. And some have said they blew it um, nine times every day. Others say they blew it 11 times every day. And then once, the final last one on the Day of Atonement, and um, that was the last trump. Well, that's, that's possible. The Bible doesn't tell us. So that would just be tradition. But it says, lift up your voice like a trumpet. The so trumpet is involved in this passage. And show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. The focus is on the sins. The Day of Atonement is the day in the year when we're going to deal with all the sins of all the people. They seek me daily to know my ways. And so on. Uh, and then in verse 3, it says, Wherefore have we fasted? Now, this is the people speaking. Why have we fasted? Say they. And, and you don't see our, our suffering. We've been fasting here. We fast three times a week. What is that what the publican says? I fast three times a week. I tithe my aunt, my mini, uh, uh, cumin, and huh? the Pharisee. I said publican. Oh, I'm sorry. Strike that from the record. Pharisee. Uh, he's, he's fasting. He's doing all the proper things. And look at me. Look, look what I'm doing here. This ought to be good for something. Don't I get some brownie points for this? But he says, uh, the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exact all your labors. You fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. What, and what did Jesus say? Matthew chapter 7. What, how do you fast? Do you fast like the uh, Pharisees so that everybody can see your long face and, and they know you're fasting and you tell everybody you're fasting? Huh? Yeah, you wash your face, anoint your head with oil and you go out as if it's any other day. Huh? Go in the yeah, pray in the closet too. Verse 5. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? We're talking about Day of Atonement here, I believe. This is Day of Atonement. Is it to bow down your head as a bulrush and put sackcloth and ashes? And, and you call that a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Is it not this? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness. Stop sinning. Now there's a practical fast. I'm going to take a fast from sinning. To undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke, people who are in bondage and suppressed by other people. Is it not to deal your bread to the hungry? We better get some bread down to Puerto Rico. Got to do something. Are they? What about that that ship, the U.S.N. Comfort? What was the name of the ship? 
Huh? Supposed to be sending a ship down there. Uh, it's a, a hospital ship. Huh? You had to get down there? Well, they need to send some others too with some food and some equipment and repair their stuff. Get them back. It's a big island, yeah. Bring the poor that are cast out into your house. When you see the naked, cover him, hide him, not from your own fle- and hide not from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth of this morning, and your health spring forth speedily. Oh, you want to be healthy? That's the kind of fast. Why, um, why is the Day of Atonement necessary? If you go to the next chapter in Isaiah, it explains why. Oh, well, we should go on. You know, this, is, this chapter 58 also talks about making the Sabbath a delight and uh, honorable and uh, not doing your own things on His holy day. The Day of Atonement is the Sabbath of the Sabbaths. So all of these things, all the elements are here in chapter 58, pointing us to the Day of Atonement. The next chapter says why this was necessary. Because our sins have separated us from our God. But God has a plan to deal with that. He's going to remove the sins. He's going to Take them away as far as the east is from the west in the depths of the sea. We went through all that before you came in, all these texts. Um, reconcile us back to God. We are separated. Reconcile. We're going to come back together. Not imputing their transgressions. Romans 5.11 That we receive, because of the sacrifice of Christ, we receive the atonement by His blood. So all that blood, all the sacrifices, all are symbols of the blood of Jesus. Well, the blood we already talked about was poured out the altar, was sprinkled on the altar, was sprinkled before the veil, was put on the horns of the uh, uh, altar of incense, and ultimately, on the Day of Atonement, taken into the Most Holy Place and sprinkled on the mercy seat. <clears throat> now, Got to drink water. Drink more water. The mercy seat. This is the word we were <clears throat> investigating this last week when we were camping. The word in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. We read already or recited verse 9. In this is manifested the love of God toward us because that he, God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. Verse 10. God sent his only begotten son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now there's a word <clears throat> I don't use every day. How about you? Propitiation. It just rolls off your tongue, doesn't it? Well, uh, let's break it down. Pro. Are you a pro? Are you pro anything? You hear about people who are pro life. They promote. They provide. Protect. These are all things that are for somebody else. Uh, we're giving. Propitiation is God's gift to us in giving His Son. Propitiate. To take away is expiate. That's another word. Ex. To extract. To excise. <laughs> That's to cut out. Uh, to exit. Just to go. You know, it's... All these X's are to remove, to separate. Pro is to give. 
bring together. The mercy seat is where the blood was sprinkled on the Day of Atonement. What's under the mercy seat? The Ten Commandments. In the ark. The mercy seat is on the ark. What's above the mercy seat? Shekinah. Two cherubs. And between the cherubs? The Shekinah glory. The presence of God. The high priest. Who's our high priest? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, 14, 15. We have such a high priest who is not in the temples built by hands, but is at the right hand of the majesty on high. The temple in heaven. There's the real temple. That's the real deal. There's where the real day of atonement takes place. And the propitiation, the, the blood of Jesus is going to be between us and the law. What does the law say? This is what you must be. Here's what I am. It's not what I must be. Uh-oh. I'm in trouble. We're in trouble. But there's the pure blood of the sinless one who was tempted in all points like as us but without sin. And he says, I will come between you and the law because I am the law, the living law and I will sacrifice myself for you. But the blood does more than that. The blood cleanses. Do you know that? Can you be cleansed by blood? We sing about it. What can take away my sin? That was our opening hymn. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. He was pierced in his side and out came blood and water. Water for cleansing. Blood for cleansing. Two different kinds of cleansing. Two different, maybe. Uh, this, these are just interesting thoughts. The word for uh, propitiation, there is translated propitiation, in the New Testament is in Greek. And the word is Hilasterion. That's not a word we use very often either. Hilasterion. In Hebrew, it's kaporet. Now, have you ever heard of Yom Kippur? It's very closely related to kapor. Kaporet, kapor, kapor, kapor. It means to cover. And that's where our word, English word cover comes from. It comes from the Hebrew. Kapor, cover. Cupboard. Cupboard doors. Same related uh, entomologically. It is a cover. Now what is he going to do? He's going to cover our sins with his blood. He's going to blot them out and, and cover over. Well, I, I'll show you. Okay, let's, let's go on. Um, and Daniel chapter 7 talks about a time when the the uh, Ancient of Days is gathered with thousands of thousands of angels and ten thousands times ten thousands and the books are open, the judgment is set and the books are open. What are those books? If you go looking through the Bible you can find several books. Malachi talks about a book of remembrance. You make lists so you can remember things. <laughs> uh, Book of Remembrance. Uh, Book of Life. Revelation mentions this a number of times. I've got it there. Chapter 3, chapter 13, chapter 17, also in chapter 21. It says the Lamb's Book of Life. Not in chapter 20. 
Uh, chapter 20, where the great white throne and the book of life is opened. Those who are not in the book of life, you want to be in the book of life. <laughs> uh, Let's talk about judgment. John chapter 8 described an event, an episode in Jesus' life. The leaders brought, toward, brought to him a woman. You remember this? It was a judgment. They had made judgment on her and they wanted to know what Jesus' judgment was. And they were hoping that they could pass judgment on him as well. Well, let's read about it. The scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst. Now that's an important expression. They set her in the midst. They said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. In the very act, caught her red-handed. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? What is your judgment? How do you judge? This they said, tempting him, that they might accuse him. They were really judging Jesus, weren't they? Jesus is on the spot. They're going to see how he is going to react here. But Jesus stooped down. He didn't say anything. And with his finger, he wrote on the ground. How would you do that? How do you write on the ground? Where are they? I don't know. It might have been in the temple somewhere. But he's, he's able to trace something there sand and the dust and the dirt, whatever it is, the pavement. Some words. He's got a message for them. We'd, wouldn't you like to know what those were? We, we're not told what they are. So when they continued asking him, he kept, they said, come on, speak up. I want you to answer us. He stood back up. He lifted himself up and he said, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone at her. He has qualified now their statement about Moses and his law. Moses said in the law that such should be stoned. Jesus says, that's fine. He that is without sin should be the one to participate in this. And again he, stood, he stooped back down and he started writing some more. And when they which heard were convicted by their own conscience, was it because he said, you who are without sin? Maybe they started thinking about all the things that might be considered sin in their lives. Or was it what he was writing on the ground? Something convicted them. And one by one, starting with the eldest, they left. And he's left alone with the woman. Jesus and this woman. Now there's something that happens in Numbers chapter 5 that parallels this. And I think it explains why Jesus was writing on the dust of the floor. And why this woman is there. And the message that he's giving to these leaders. And they make the connection. Let's look at Numbers chapter 5. If a man's wife go aside and commit a trespass, it's a sin against her husband, and the man, uh, a man a lie with her carnally, and it's hid from the eyes of her husband, and he be kept close, and she is defiled, and there's no witness, a lot like this woman who's caught in the very act. There is no witness against her, neither is she taken. These people, were, they took this woman. And the spirit of jealousy comes upon him, and he's jealous for his wife that she's defiled, or... Here's another possibility. What if she's innocent? She didn't do anything. But he's jealous. He thinks she's up to something. And the spirit of jealousy comes upon him. And she is not defiled. Two situations. 
and we don't know which one it is. Now it's very similar to Jesus' encounter. They bring this woman. They say she's caught in the very act of adultery. Their demand is that she be stoned. Notice that here in Numbers 5, there's nothing about whether she should be stoned or not. But uh, let's read on. Then shall the man bring his wife to the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her. There's an offering, tenth part of the ephah of barley meal. And pour no oil on it like you do other meal offerings. No frankincense like you do the other ones. It's an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial. This is to memory, to bring to memory something. And to bring iniquity to remembrance. We're going to flush out the truth. This is truth serum. It's a lie detector test. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. Now what did these people do? They brought this woman and they set her in the midst before Jesus. And the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel and the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle. He's going to take that and put it in the water. Mix the dust with the holy water. And this is going to become the water of cursing. The priest shall set the woman before the Lord and uncover her head, put the offering of the memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering, and the priest shall have in his hands the bitter water that causes the curse. What curse? Have we seen the curse yet? And the priest shall charge her by an oath and say to the woman, If no one has lain with you, and you're innocent, and uh, you have not gone aside, and done anything wrong against your husband, then you are free from this bitter water that causes the curse. It's going to be absolutely harmless to you. won't do a thing. But if you have gone aside to somebody else other than your husband, and you've defiled yourself, and some other man is laying with you other than your husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing. And the priest shall say to the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among the people. And the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. I don't know about the thigh to rot piece. I haven't figured that out yet. But if she has messed around, will her belly swell? It may. It very well could swell. Okay. So she is either guilty or not guilty. And the priest shall write these curses in a book. Now here we come. This is what Jesus writing on the ground. Is he writing the curses? He's got the dust. Where's the holy water? He says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me. For out of his belly shall come rivers of water. Right? There's the holy water. He's the holy one. He's got the holy water. He's going to mix this with the dust of the floor. He's writing curses. But who are the curses for? Is they for this woman? It's for anyone who has sinned. It's for all. The curses for all sinners. But now, look what happens here. And he shall blot them out, blot out the curses with the bitter water. He writes them in the book and then he erases them. What has Jesus done on the ground? He went back to writing. Maybe he wiped it out, wrote some more, wiped it out. I, I don't know. It's, there's a parallel here. Now, what can be blotted out? Deuteronomy 29, 30, uh, 29, 30. Moses had, after the golden calves, you remember, he went to, back up to the mountain, Mount Sinai. He'd broken the Ten Commandments. He said, you've broken the covenant. You might as well break these Ten Commandments, which is the covenant. And he says, peradventure, I can make atonement for you. He tells the people this. After he made them eat the golden calf. You know, they had to swallow the golden calf. He ground it down into powder, threw it in the creek there in the water. And what happens when you put finely pulverized gold into water? Do you know what color it turns? Red. Yeah. Colloidal gold in water is red because of the light refraction and, and the uh, properties of gold in water. 
Anyway, it says that they, they drank that. He goes back up to the mountain, and uh, God says, stand aside, let me blot them out, I'll make a, better, a greater nation out of you. And he says, no, you can't do that. What will the other nations think? This will have a terrible uh, effect on your reputation as a savior. You're going to save these people. You can't do that. He says, if you do, he says, blot my name out, but save them. This is Moses speaking. And he's recounting this in chapter 29. And he says, no, God said, no. He who has cursed, who has done any of these curses, and he just got through uh, having the, the cur- blessings and the curses, chapter 27, 28. Those who have cursed, their names will be blotted out, not yours. Psalm 51, David prays after his sin with Bathsheba. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Blot out my iniquities. That's what you want to have blotted out. Now, He's, the priest is blotting out the curses which are for those who have committed iniquities, who have committed sin. If you blot out the curses, where is it? Where there is no law, there is no sin. If you blot out the curses, you've, blotted out, you've gotten rid of the sin. You've removed them as far as the east or the west. You've put them into the depths of the sea. They're gone. He's forgiven you. He's pardoned your iniquities. And the priest shall write these curses in the book. He shall blot them out with bitter water and shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causes the curse and the water that causes the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. Then the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hand and shall wave the offering before the Lord and offer it on the altar. And if the woman be not defiled but be clean, then she shall be free. And the verse goes on to say, and shall conceive seed. The cross, we're told, casts a shadow over the whole Old Testament. It was a shadow. All those sacrifices were shadows of good things to come. But the Day of Atonement does something as well. I found this very interesting statement here. The Redeemer, as the great high priest of mankind, the one who through the sacrifice of his own life was to make atonement for sin once for all and was there to take up his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. Not the one made by hands down here on earth, which was made after a pattern of the one in heaven. The one in heaven, that's the real one. The quote goes on. His death was the antitype of all the sacrificial offerings and that his ministry in the sanctuary in heaven was the great object that cast its shadow backward. Did you know that the ministry in heaven casts a shadow? Have you ever heard that before? I had never seen this. I always had heard and been told that the, the cross is the sh- it casts the shadow back into... And it does, because all those sacrifices pointed to the sacrifice. But there is an atonement that is made on the Day of Atonement in the heavenly sanctuary that casts its shadow as well. What is... What is it that our high priest is wanting to do for us? Now that he has died and has shed his blood once for all, but he takes that blood into the heavenly sanctuary. Here's the shadow. (laughs) What he's doing in heaven is a shadow of the other thing. There's a shadow of the cross, shadows of the covenant. 
Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Uh, some have said, oh, holy place. He went into the holy place, not the most holy place. Well, if you look in, in chapter 9, you'll see that holy place is being used as the designation of what we would say the most holy place, and tabernacle of the congregation is the term that's used for the holy, what we would say is the holy place. Both terms are used there. Anyway, he's taking his blood. And what's he doing with that? What is that blood? What now is he doing with the blood? Is he using it? Huh? Yes. Um, to obtain eternal redemption. Okay, let's, let's see here. There's a new song. I played this last night. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption, having obtained eternal redemption. I'll do that one again. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, Entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption, having obtained eternal redemption. And how much more shall the blood of Christ? Who through the eternal spirit How much more shall the blood of Christ Who through the eternal spirit Offered himself without spot to God Purge your conscience from dead works To serve the living God To serve the living God God, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from death? He's purging our conscience. Remember in Malachi, in Micah, no, it was uh, Micah 7. Not only would he pardon our iniquities, but he would subdue our iniquities. What does he say? What does he say the blood of uh, Jesus in 1 John chapter 1 verse 6 and 7? There's power in the blood. <laughs> First John, okay, here we go. If we walk in the light, verse 7, let's do it. As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The blood cleanses us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That's pardon iniquity and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Subdue our iniquities. Huh? Takes away. Takes away. Yeah, he's going to purify us. Huh? The old blood sacrifice is blotted out the sin. Yeah. But Jesus' blood takes them away. Takes them away, yes. The Lamb of God that takes away. Yes, he takes them away. As far as the east and the west. Oh, yeah. 
No question about it. So I mean, he takes them away. He takes them away. Completely purge. Hebrews 10, verse 19. came out of great tribulation. Revelation chapter 7, talking about this great multitude which no man could number. First of all, it talks about the 144,000. Then it says there's a great multitude. And they washed their robes and made them white by the blood of the Lamb. You ever tried to make anything white with blood? (laughs) This is no ordinary blood. This is a special kind of blood. Revelation chapter 12, they overcame him. Now the him here is the accuser of the brethren who's cast down, the verse right before this. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Ezekiel 20, 36, 25 and 26, and they sh- then shall he sprinkle us with clean water and we shall be clean. A new heart will he give us, a new spirit will he put within us. Isaiah 52, Behold my servant. This is talking about the Son of God. Shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. And I think Mel Gibson did a pretty good job of of depicting that. But now the last verse, So shall he sprinkle many nations. He's going to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And it's going to be for many nations. That blood is effectual. It can cleanse. It can remove sin. If we let him into our life and cleanse our temples. That's the real temple that needs to be cleansed now today. Jesus did it twice. He cleansed the temple twice. And it's time for him to cleanse it again in us. That he might sanctify his church and cleanse it, not having any spot or wrinkle. His wife has made herself ready. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the linen is the righteousness of the saints. It's time for our closing hymn. Yes. Nobody's going to hear you. Yellow. Yellow. What more can he do? He says, than I have done for my vineyard. Let's get sprinkled. What do you say? Okay, let's stand for our closing hymn. Well, have it up there. Uh, Oh, the Father's waiting. Longing desire for the manifestation of self in his church, when thy character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then shall he come to claim his own. And only he can do that. He's going to reproduce his character in us because he dwells in us. Then shall I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. Then shall I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Then 
shall I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. Then shall I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. pray as we close. Father, we thank you for the great gift that you have given. What a sacrifice to give your son to die for us, to shed his blood, that perfect spotless blood that cleanses from sin, that has power to purge our consciences and to change our hearts into new minds and hearts with your mind, the mind of Christ. Let it be in us and make us more like him. Every day is our prayer. In his name, amen.